JBS presents exclusive television coverage of the Jerusalem Post Conference from the Marriott Marquis Hotel in New York City. Jewish state and the Jewish homeland. But the question of is it the state for all Jews is a question that we grapple with every day at the Jerusalem Post, where we look at issues of is religious practice in Israel, freedom to pray at the Kotel, conversions, civil marriage. Today we have a panel to be moderated by Herb Kanan with representatives from across the religious spectrum of the Jewish people. The participants are Jerry Silverman, the president and CEO of the Jewish Federations of North America, Rabbi Julie Schoenfeld, Executive Vice President of the Rabbinical Assembly, Rabbi Rick Jacobs, President of the Union for Reform Judaism, and Rabbi David Eliezri, Founder and Director of the North County Chabad Center. Please join me in welcoming our moderator and the participants of our panel. Good afternoon. We have 30 minutes to, to dissect what's, 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 what's plaguing the Jewish people. Um, is Israel the state of all the Jews? On the surface, that question seems kind of a no-brainer, right? I mean, obviously, Israel is supposed to be the state of all Jews. That's why it's, it's reason for being. That's why it absorbed so many Jews over other years. That's why we have the law of return. But is it really the state of all the Jews? Do diaspora Jews feel anymore that it is their state, that they can identify with it? That question is especially timely now as we read about increasing disenfranchisement from, by, by young American Jews because of Israel's policies in the settlements with the Palestinians in the territories, its treatment of the different streams of Judaism in Israel, and also the Kotel issue. Um, at 69, it's, it's a good time to look at what is the relationship between Israel and the diaspora and where it's going. So I'd just like to start the panel off by asking each of you briefly to tell me whether indeed you think Israel still is the state of the Jewish people. Start over here. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and it's uh, a, a privilege to be on this panel with three uh, distinguished rabbis uh, and Herb also. Um, so to answer the question very directly, I believe Israel is unquestionably the Jewish state for all Jews. Uh, not even a question mark there. But at just 69 years old, and I mean just 69 years young, there is still work to be done to ensure that all Jews feel at home and respected there. This dream in 1897 by Herzl, after two millennia of a, uh, and having now a state of Israel, uh, and especially the is Israel coming about at a time when Jewish survival was paramount concern, it is understandable that questions about the exact nature of what being a Jewish state would mean uh, that they would be deferred at that time. Today, however, Jews around the world, with but a few exceptions, live in greater freedom than at any other time in our history. Israel itself has achieved an inspiringly high degree of economic prosperity and security and it seems that at times like these, it shouldn't even be a question. Yet, in some ways, we are more divided than ever before. And what is dividing us? Questions about what it means to be Jewish. There is an Israeli saying, what you see from here, you can't see from there. And the more I think about this question, the truer that seems to me. The two largest centers of Jewish life today are in Israel and North America, and, they, and we live and deal with such different realities and circumstances that I wonder how it could be otherwise. And for many American Jews, particularly those for whom Jewish identity is less about ritual and more about a shared set of values, these include both Jewish values such as social justice and tikkun olam, and American values, such as the separation of religion and state. 
Yet Israelis live in a society where politics and religion are completely intertwined and questions of national identity and self-preservation are anything but theoretical. Our mission at Jewish Federations is building and strengthening the Jewish people and Jewish community locally, nationally, and around the world. Our relationship with Israel is central to that effort and like with most important relationships, keeping it strong and vibrant takes a lot of hard work. And for Federation, this includes a lot of programs that we do, Massah, Birthright, etc. cetera. Uh, and we also represent the North American community on issues of concern that deal with the Kotel, conversion, democratic values, as Herbs said. Uh, we believe very strongly uh, not just in a shared Jewish past, but in a common Jewish future. Let me end where I began. Israel is only 69 years old. Where was America in 1845 at 69? Israel is a miracle, and the Israel of today is so different than the Israel I visited for the first time in 1969. I believe Israel is the state for all Jews today and will grow and evolve so, Bezrat Hashem, this isn't a question for the next generation. Rabbi Jacobs, the, the reform movement is not accepted by the rabbinate in Israel. For you, is Israel the state of all the Jews? Uh, without a doubt, Israel is the state of all the Jews. Uh, it is the greatest miracle, perhaps, in not only modern times, but throughout our history. So, we are completely intertwined with both the hopes, the dreams, the challenges, and frankly, the miracle of Israel. Having said that, I would say that though Israel is the state of all the Jews, we are facing some of the most fixable problems. And we, we together are not only representing different streams of Judaism, but we actually work here in North America where there's a level playing field. In Israel, currently, the ultra-Orthodox Rabbanut has monopoly over religious life. And so the playing field is not level. And it's really a constant struggle for so many people uh, to find their way into Judaism, to find their way into the Judaism that speaks to them. And still, the overwhelming majority of Israelis say that the the way in which Judaism is imposed upon their lives is problematic. So what we've been, many of us have been working on at the, at the Western Wall, the Kotel, is to make that a symbol that we have one wall for one people, meaning there's different ways for people to be at the wall. Obviously, a Haredi Jew should have the right and obvious place for them to pray, but so should the majority of Jews in the world who are non-Orthodox. And the Kotel is just, it's just a semel, it's just a sign of what should be throughout the society. Civil marriage, 75% of Israelis say that people should have a choice in marriage. Currently, if you compare Israel, which imposes strict limitations on who can perform a wedding, the only other countries that have such restrictions are countries, and it's painful to even say it out loud, countries like Libya, Yemen, Egypt. So Israel is the state of all the Jews, but we need to have more freedom of religious expression. People should be able to choose. If they want to choose to live a Chabad way of life, kol kavod. If they want to live the Masorti Judaism, that is their choice. If they want to be secular. But currently, what is happening with the fusion of religion and politics, it is disaffecting not only the majority of Jews in Israel, but Jews around the world say, how can the, the, the chief rabbis speak for all of us. I sent a young woman on Aliyah just a couple of years ago. She was adopted at a uh, very early age, raised in an observant reform household, went to day school, spoke Hebrew, made Aliyah as a single woman. She is not able to marry in the Jewish state, period. So somebody explained to me how that is the fulfillment of the dream we've had as a people for 2,000 years. So we need to have not a US separation of religion and state, but we need to disassociate the orthodox monopoly from the free flourishing of the Jewish people and the Jewish community. And if we do, we'll not only have Israel as the state of all Jews, 
but a place where all of us will be free to practice and to live lives of Jewish depth and commitment. Thank you. Uh, Rabbi Eliezer, how would you respond to Rabbi Jacobs? I mean, is well, Israel, I would, is Israel I see the on... problem very, very differently. First, if we're sitting here together, my friend Rabbi Schoenfeld, Rabbi Jacobs, Jerry, the truth is we're only representing a small portion of American Jewry. About 25% of American Jewry belongs to the Reform and Conservative movement. Another 25% belongs either to Orthodox or maybe active in Chabad, That's... according to memberships. But the vast majority of American Jews today, young millennials, are not engaged in Jewish life. And they're not engaged with Jewish life, not because the Kotel, without question, speaks to many, some Jews in the liberal Jewish community, but the vast majority of American Jews today are just not interested in Judaism. And we see this, you know, a couple of years ago when the fall of the Soviet Union, Arik Sharon was very upset with Chabad for building Jewish infrastructure in Russia. And he invited the chief rabbi of Russia, Rabbi Lazar, and somebody else to meet with him and said, stop building schools and stop building shuls, everybody should move. And they said the great majority of Jews in Russia who are there, who already didn't leave, they don't know anything about Judaism. We're gonna build this educational system. They're gonna know what Judaism is and then they're gonna to wanna to connect to Israel. The Jews of America, the 50% who are unengaged with the community, they're like the Jews of Russia almost. They don't know much about Judaism. And they're not really concerned about these issues. Young millennials are really not all concerned of these issues. But when you change the educational focus and you put the focus on the spiritual core of Judaism, and we see this so interesting. There was a study done recently about Jewish life on campus and students from reform and conservative backgrounds who go to Chabad, which has a tremendous focus, not necessarily on social action or the liberal vision of tikkun olam, but the more the spiritual center, suddenly their connection to Israel grows dramatically. They don't necessarily become observant, but they go through a transformation. So our prime pro problem with American Jews that are disenfranchised is not these issues which without question appeal to the leadership and, and the core constituencies of the liberal movements in America. The problem is they don't know much about Judaism and our job is to connect them to the spiritual center of the Jewish people. Rabbi, uh, thank you. Rabbi Schoenfeld, if I understand what Rabbi Eliezer is saying, he's saying that but most American Jews really don't care that much about the Kotel issue, that it's an issue for the laity, it's an issue for the leadership. Uh, what do you think about that? I mean, is there, is there validity to that argument? Uh, I, I was getting ready to respond to the first question, but I can switch right ahead <laughs> to the Kotel. Uh, I, do, though, I do, though, have to say, with, with respect, and, and by the way, this group of people here, we really are friends and are close colleagues, and so, uh, with great respect, Rabbi Eliezer, you and I should sit sometime. I have different statistics based on the Pew study, but I just didn't want my silence to be agreement. Um, on the subject of the Kotel, look, for decades, every trip, every synagogue trip in our movement, this was probably true in the reform movement, it was probably true of Orthodox synagogues taking synagogue trips. They picked you up at the airport and they took you to the Kotel. And the Kotel is, of course, symbolic of the fact, is, is Israel the state of all Jews? Well, it is certainly the spiritual, the historical, the religious, the peoplehood homeland of all Jews. It is the place of our origins. It is the place of our destiny. And the Kotel is a very tangible symbol that you can touch of all of those things. Now, interestingly, that um, kind of shared agreement that the first stop on an Israel trip was to go to the Kotel, that has really disappeared, right? We don't do that anymore, generally, because the Kotel symbolically and literally became a place um, both of, uh, really of, of discomfort. Uh, Maya Angelou, the poet laureate, said, I won't remember what you said to me, but I will remember how you made me feel. And so the question isn't, is Israel the state of all Jews? Of course it is. The question is whether all Jews feel that way, right? Are being, and also are being made to feel welcome there. Let me ask you, let me add to a follow up on that and ask you, why do you think this issue is so burning for American Jews but not for Israeli Jews? I mean, the, 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 the people carrying the torch on the whole Kotel issue is the American Jewish community, not necessarily the Israeli Jews. Why is that? Well, 
Because the Kotel as a, as a symbolic destination, right, as a place, the, the Kotel, because of its incredible connection to our historic origins, to the Beit HaMikdash, is a place that all of world Jewry, towards which we have directed our attentions, our prayers, the, the Israeli people are going about their daily lives, right? They are not focused on a hotel in Yerushalayim. They are focused on the bus route to work and the traffic and their jobs, etc. cetera. It, it became a very powerful, symbolic um, place for a Jewish vision of what it means to bring our spiritual yearnings to Israel. And I want to say that as a conservative Masorti Jewish leader, it is, it is extremely painful that after many years slowly of a, a buildup of opportunity for people to pray at the Kotel in their own fashion, those people who wanted to pray separately, men from women, and those groups that wanted to pray with the genders together, after this growth from perhaps 200 people a year to tens of thousands of people a year, through the breakdown in this Kotel deal, we are now finding ourselves with that Robinson's Arch site sometimes locked and shuttered in the morning when we go there to pray. Rabbi Eliezer, I want to ask you what Rabbi Jacob said. Rabbi Jacob was saying that the, the Haredim, the ultra Orthodox, have a monopoly on, the, on, on religion in Israel. Uh, and it's turning a lot of people off, not only American Jews, but also Israeli Jews as well. Uh, how do you respond to that? I, mean, I, is that, is that I, I, I happen to believe that we need a strong, compassionate, well-run uh, Rabbanut. And this is a debate that Rabbi Jacobs and I have been having for a very long time. And I believe that the new chief rabbi, in particular, David Lau, is trying his best to move in that direction, but there's many barriers in front of that. I think when we have one system for marriage and one system for divorce, we can all marry each other, and I think there's a great value to that system. At the same time, I think that the system has to be compassionate and caring, and I think that's been a weakness in the past decades, and I think it needs to change. But I do believe in halacha as a binding force of all Jews, and also it's important to remember that if you look at diaspora Jewry, in particular beyond the United States, the great majority of synagogues around the world are Orthodox, outside of the United States in particular, the great majority are Orthodox. In Israel, the same thing is also true. I mean, there's 550 Orthodox synagogues in Tel Aviv, and there's one or two, I don't know how many Reformed temples, but not, uh, there's one or two of them, or one or two Masorati congregations. That's how Jews choose to vote with their feet. But we're still, what we're doing is we're dancing around here the public issue. The guts of the problem is not, the kotel we're gonna argue about, and that's really the leadership of the communities and the core constituencies. But why are young American Jews, they're not interested, their Judaism is not relevant to them. And unless we teach them the beauty of Judaism, then they're gonna get to these other issues later on. And we need to ask ourselves a bigger moral question. You know, it's interesting that in Israel, Chabad does not have a, we're not part of the political system. We vote, but we don't have a party. So usually what happens in the city of Afula when they want to give out a synagogue, a site for a synagogue or a preschool, we get shafted. Now, I don't march my people in California or someplace else down to the local Israeli government and scream gewalt. Why? Because I am interested in building up in a positive way their connection to Israel. And I feel that the, as much as I understand the angst in the liberal movements that Julie has and Rick has, and I understand it fully, I think in a sense that by making this the core issue, instead of building the positive and then bringing people to Israel and making change if that happens, is would be a much better approach in a positive way here in America. Rabbi Jacobs, is there something to the argument? What he's saying essentially is that the, the rabbis are poisoning the wells to a certain degree uh, because they're coming out and speaking so forcefully against the Kotel and turning people against Israel. How, how do you respond first, to this? First of all, for Rabbi Eliezer, who I admire and love as a brother, to speak about how he understands the experience of a non-Orthodox Jew when he himself is part of that religious establishment and enjoys every one of its privileges and every bit of its respect. So for him to say he understands what it's like to have none of that official recognition is I think a little disingenuous. So I just would, would just wanna give you a little bit of a frame that it's not about speaking against we love the state of Israel. We build more connection, more love, in spite of the fact 
that when the whole Kotel issue got started, it was because on Rosh Chodesh Cheshvan, Anat Hoffman was arrested for the crime of wearing a talit and praying the Shema out loud. And the Prime Minister of Israel said, Givalt, what has happened to our Jewish state if that has happened? That's not only a news story on the front page of the newspapers, it's a busha for us. So he said to Natan Sharansky, please fix this. So we're not thinking that the issue of, of the lack of freedom in religion is the main problem. It is a very large fixable problem. And when you talk about all the synagogues in Tel Aviv and Afula and Be'er Sheva, they're built by the state of Israel. And the salaries of all those wonderful rabbis are paid by the state of Israel. That's a wonderful thing if you happen to be a beneficiary, as you are. But for all those who don't find a home, a spiritual home, in any of those synagogues, that is our opportunity to broaden the Judaism of the Jewish state and to say that no matter how you choose to believe or pray that you're part of the Jewish people, we have a sense of Am Yisrael. We're one people and we're around the globe. And I would tell you that the majority of Jews in North America, by the way, I would agree with Rabbi Schoenfeld, I love you, but we gotta do the math. We gotta sit down. Your demographics are so off. We are the 11% of American Jews belong please, to this. Please, please, yeah. please, you had your moment, but I'm gonna tell you the majority of the Jews in North America, please, the majority of Jews in North America want the state of Israel to respect them and to allow their rabbis to officiate at their weddings, to allow the, the, the teaching of the, of the Jewish tradition in their schools to reflect the diversity that is the Jewish people. So I think we have, by the way, we're not, we're not obsessed with the Kotel. We actually want change to come in many forms. Civil marriage. We want there to be freedom for marriage. We want there to be freedom more in terms of conversion. We want there to be more equality and funding of institutions, whether they be rabbinical seminaries or schools. So across the waterfront, that's what we want. The Kotel is one of the agreements. Why is it that the chief rabbi, when Naftali Bennett came to New York, went as the diaspora affairs minister to an amazing Solomon Schechter school and was so impressed by the Hebrew learning and the knowledge of Tzionut that he actually made a public statement and the chief rabbi, the Ashkenazi chief rabbi said, how dare he go to a non-Orthodox school in the diaspora that is teaching and connecting Jewish young people to Judaism and to the state of Israel. So we have an opportunity and we have a challenge and we are gonna cause the disaffection of even more. And it's, and it's from some of our most Judaically connected young people that they see the state of Israel as a, sometimes as a disrespecting force in their lives, and that is not okay. Thank you. Uh, Jerry. Jerry is the head of the Federation. I mean, to what degree has this impacted on the commitment of the American Jewish public towards Israel? I mean, have you, have you felt that people are not giving to the degree that they used to because of this issue? Uh, not at all. Uh, what I'm seeing is uh, people engaging in the issue itself across the board on all sides. Uh, it has created dialogue, it's created debate, it's created debate at our tables. Um, it's engaged people. The one thing we have to really think about is what's being done. What's really happening uh, as Rabbi El Eliezer talks about the young people and the millennials. I mean, let's look at the fact that now 600,000 young people have gone on birthright over the last 15 years, 600,000, okay? And now communities across America, uh, both from a congregational sense and a federation sense, are creating follow-up programs to follow up on this ignition, this ignition of curiosity, of passion and connection. Uh, number two, let's talk about Massah. 13,000 kids are studying either in Yeshivot or other programs in Israel this year. Over 150,000 have gone on long-term programs right now. And now there's programs to not only help them uh, take that back with them and more prepare them to go on college campuses than they are, uh, but even more so. And a new program, over 5,000 uh, college kids this summer will be doing internships in Israel on a program called Onward. This is just an example of the community 
uh, at large, uh, stepping up and taking the challenge that Rabbi Eliezer is suggesting about the fact that we have to educate, educate, and educate. And there's so many new programs that are going on communally and bringing our kids to the connection of Israel that, that it's something special. But, but with all those numbers and all those programs, what I constantly read is about American Jewish youth is becoming more distant from Israel. So, I mean, so how do you explain that, that, that gap there? Well, there's two things. Number one is, you know, how much are you going to believe what you read? Number one. <laughs> Number two. How much do I believe what I write? Uh, what you write. <laughs> Number two is sit and talk with these young people. You know, young people today uh, are more informed than we ever were uh, when we were in college today. Good news is, I think that from a point of, we were actually reading newspapers because nothing else existed, uh, or magazines. Today, it's instant information, and they're only reading headlines today. Uh, but they are reading. And when I go on campuses today, when I go with young people today, I don't see that ignorance. I don't see that uh, lack of passion or that lack of understanding or even push away. I'm seeing a little bit more hunger and I'm seeing more kids, and I mean students, participate uh, today in programs, whether they're to Israel, whether they're to do social action together and do chesed across the world than at any other time in the last 50 years. Thank you, Rabbi Schoenfeld. To what degree do you think Prime Minister Netanyahu's policies are responsible for a, a dissonance between the American Jewish community and Israel, or, or a distancing between the American Jewish community? And does it matter? Do the policies matter? If there was a different set of policies, would there be more support here? Well, first of all, that's a very, when you speak about the head of a state and you say that person's policies, that refers to an awful lot of things. Um, I think that American Jewry has a very robust, vigorous relationship to the state of Israel, looks at um, policies across the board pertaining to the state of Israel with an intelligent point of view, and appropriately, people have a range of ideas. That is a different issue from a question of whether uh, Israel on matters of personal status, right, as opposed to political points of view, on personal status welcomes and is the state of all Jews. So the questions of uh, the acceptance of conversions taking place outside of the Orthodox movement, the question, as my colleague Rabbi Jacobs mentioned, key questions, civil marriage, uh, in the state of Israel. Um, the question of all kinds of rights for women, et cetera, in the state of Israel. There's, it, it's not one, I don't think you can say that there's one set of responses to one set of policies, nor do I think that we would want to see our young people disengaged. In fact, it is often our young people who are thoughtful and critical, who are on campus, right, acting as intermediaries Right, and really able to give tell to the lie of BDS. Those are often our strongest advocates. But I do think that we have to distinguish between the political question and the range of views and the fact that Jews of all forms of Judaism should be recognized, welcomed, accepted in the Jewish state. Uh, Rabbi Eliezer, uh, I want to ask a kind of a Zionist question. Do you think it's the role of American Jewish leaders, Rabbeim, uh, to encourage Aliyah? To what? To encourage Aliyah. I think that bringing a Jew to Israel is a wonderful thing, and I also feel the way we need to go about Israel education is different. And I listened today for a lot of ministers. You know, we had a lot of ministers here speaking with the Balfour Declaration, the UN, a Hare and a Hin, et cetera, et cetera. The reason we're in Israel is not just because of history. The reason we are in Israel is because of Ramavinu, Abraham. God made a covenant with Abraham to give the land of Israel, bris ben abasarim, to the Jewish people, and it is an inherent in inheritance from Avram Yitzhak, Yaakov, Sar, Rivka, Rachel, Valeah. It's like uh, Bougie Herzog's father once got up in the uh, UN and he said, 
Hebron belongs to me because I'm a Levi, the tribe of Levi comes from Hebron. We, and what we have tried to do with our younger approach to education is to focus on the spiritual dimension of the Jews to the land of Israel, and that's what's going to encourage people to move to Israel, to be connected to Israel, to understand it's not just, we're not here in Israel because the UN had a decision in 1947, or the British had a decision in the, in the beginning in 1917. We're here because this is the land that was given to the Jewish people. It is the land which belongs to the Jewish people because God gave it to us. We have to treat other people with respect and dignity. And I want to ask one other point. We have profound differences. But I want to tell, Rick said something to me a couple of months ago. We were sitting with a government minister and we were arguing about the same things. And I said, I'm going to say something that Rick's going to be upset about. And after the whole argument, he turned to me and he says, David, we agree on a lot more than we disagree. It was a very touching moment. So even though we have very strong theological differences and the, bridge, the differences between the liberal movements and orthodoxy are really unbridgeable on a theological level, we have a common destiny as Jews. And we need to realize that even the ones that we profoundly disagree, profoundly, we need to treat each other with Abish Yisrael, with dignity, we need to debate, we need to dialogue, we need to disagree. I'm not going to change my mind too quickly. But at the same time, we have to have sensitivity and care for, for the person that we don't agree with. So Rick taught me the list that, Rick, the head of the reform movement, taught a Chabad rabbi a lesson in Avish Israel and loving your fellow Jew. Um, thank you, would you like to respond to that? Uh, I'm, I'm in favor of Ahavat Yisrael. <laughs> and I'm in favor of us learning and listening, but I also think that when you talk about the spiritual connection to the land of Israel, I would include as part of the spiritual uh, inheritance of the Jewish people, that which is tzedek and that which is right. And I would tell you that I think some of the young people would actually not feel differently, but feel closer. I'm going to give you a concrete example. We have 500 young people who are leaving in two and a half weeks on a Kesher birthright. That's the birthright uh, provider that we actually uh, lead. And they were concerned that the new entry law in Israel could potentially bar all 500 of them from entering the state of Israel. Why? Not because they are in favor of BDS, they're adamantly opposed to BDS, as am I, and I fought on college campuses and among all the liberal Protestant groups. But if you are critical of the state of Israel about policies in the West Bank, the new entry law says that you may be barred from entry. I gotta tell you, there are, there are policies that are simply anathema. The Moazine Law, I, the, the privatization bill that uh, changed the way we purchase property in the West Bank. There's a litany of government decisions that for many young people, they say, that doesn't reflect my values, my Jewish values. So I think we do have, it's not the only thing, I would say also strengthening Jewish connection will strengthen a lot of important ties to Israel. But let us not be deceived for one moment that some of that which is official government policy is for many young people today not part of their Jewish or their moral worldview. And I think that is something we should not overlook and say a little bit more Hebrew school will take care of that. Okay. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, our time is up. I, I just want to take my prerogative as the, the moderator of the panel to say one thing I found interesting about the whole Kotel argument. Because you sit in Israel and it becomes disconcerting to see Jews fight about the Kotel. But you have to put it in perspective. If we had told your great-great-great-grandparents that someday we would be fighting over who could dive and wear at the Kotel, they would look at you like you were nuts and they'd rub their ears in disbelief. So we have to put that in, in perspective, and I think that gives us a good perspective on your Matzmut. Thank you. Please join me in welcoming Eli Beer, founder and president of United Hatzalah of Israel which provides immediate emergency medical first response care across the country with a network of 3,500 completely volunteer medics utilizing innovative technology to reach patients in three minutes or less. Ladies and gentlemen, Ellie Beer.
Well, this is the only way you get on time for lunch. <laughs> well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Eli Beer. I grew up in uh, Jerusalem, Israel. I was actually born and raised in Israel, in Jerusalem. By the age of six years old, I experienced a terrible experience that, unfortunately, I don't want anyone to experience. I saw the first bomb attack on a bus ever in Israel, the number 12 bus. I was a young kid, and uh, I remember seeing the bus on fire, but more than everything, I remember an old man laying on the floor and yelling for help. And I was, I was frightened, I was scared, and I saw this man yelling and screaming for someone to help him just get up. I ran away and I left him on the floor. Couldn't do anything. I grew up, my dream was to save someone's life. So when I, the time I was 15 in Israel, you could start volunteering in an ambulance. I went to learn how to save people's lives. I became an EMT and I went to volunteer in an ambulance in Jerusalem. And my hope was that the first week I join an ambulance, I will save someone's life. Well, I did a great shift on the ambulance for eight hours. We helped many people. We had a couple of emergencies and one incident where a person had a cardiac arrest. When we got there, we were doing CPR and unfortunately we couldn't save him. Came back home, my parents were waiting up for me. It was almost midnight and they say, "New, did you save anyone today? I said, uh, no, we didn't save anyone, we tried, or whatever. A week later, the same thing again, over and over. And unfortunately, every single time we had a real emergency of someone not breathing and no pulse, we were not able to save them. Even so, if you learn how to save someone's life, you do CPR properly, you could save them. But I realized it takes us precious time to get to these people. But a year and a half after volunteering in this uh, ambulance, and I loved it, it was a great feeling. We did a lot of great things, a lot of good mitzvahs. But um, we had an incident of a seven-year-old boy who choked from a hot dog. And we got there, we were the only ambulance available. It took us 21 minutes to get to him in the other side of Jerusalem. Going through the traffic and everything going on with the roads, just to get there, the geography in Jerusalem, one side to the other side, we found this boy on the floor not breathing, completely blue, and no one did anything to do anything to help him because people were just crying and screaming and waiting for the ambulance. And when we ran up the stairs, we knew that the chances of saving this boy is almost zero. And we started working on this young boy, and a doctor who lived two blocks away came by and he said, I, he saw the ambulance parked and he ran upstairs and he said, I could help. And he tried helping and he said, nothing to do. Just bring a sheet to cover this boy. We can't help him. That moment was the worst moment of my life. I was 16 and a half years old. I saw a seven-year-old boy on the floor who choked. And I realized this boy could have been saved. He didn't die from cancer or anything that you can't find a cure for. He died from something simple that every one of us here could do and save him. And a doctor lived two blocks away from him, but no one even thought of calling him because the ambulance job is to save someone's life. The doctor is sitting at home, doesn't know anything about it. So that moment I decided to start this organization with my friends, 15 of my friends in Jerusalem to start responding to emergencies way before the ambulance arrives. It didn't make sense to me that the ambulance would be the first one saving people. Well, I was 16 and a half years old with a lot of motivation and I went over, we got together all my friends, and I went over to the ambulance organization in Yerushalayim, again, David Adom, I said, let's start this first response organization, and while you're on the way, we'll be there first and save the people's life. Well, I was very young, they didn't take me too serious, and they didn't want to cooperate. So I was stuck, what do I do now? I have these people who want to help, but we don't know any information. If someone is in trouble, how would we know about this? So I decided to use the best invention Israel ever invented called chutzpah. <laughs> and we went ahead and we bought these scanners, these police scanners, and we actually started tapping into their emergencies. And we knew what to do if someone's in trouble, we just needed to know the address. So we would listen in. Two days after we bought these scanners, I hear of a call around the block where it was, my father's bookstore in Bayt Vagan in Jerusalem, and a person was hit by a car, and I ran there by, my, by foot. I got there within 30 seconds. He was on the floor, bleeding terribly from his neck. I knew I had to stop his bleeding, but I had no medical equipment on me. 
I took my yarmulke off my head, I folded it, and I stopped his bleeding that way, just pushing it in. They took him to the hospital a few minutes, like 20 minutes later, the ambulance arrived, they took him to the hospital. Two days later, he woke up. His, his, ch his child called me and said, you're Ellie Beer? I said, yes. He said, you treated my father two days ago, and he woke up in the hospital. He wants to thank you for saving his life. I started crying. This was like the best thing. Like, literally, I couldn't get any better news than this news. And I ran to the hospital in Jerusalem, the Hadassah Hospital, and I found the person on the bed, and he gave me a hug. And when he gave me a hug, I saw he had a number on his hand. That moment changed my life forever. And I knew this is what I, I want to do. And we started with 15 volunteers, and I said to myself, I, took, I made a calculation if I said, if we want to get there in a response time of 90 seconds, we want to change history for generations, if you think about it. When someone was sick or not breathing, they would call a doctor over to their home until a doctor comes, sometimes days or hours, people would not survive. And then the ambulance is a new generation. About 100 years ago, they started the ambulance services. If someone's not feeling well, you call an ambulance, and they come to you. Instead of you calling the doctor and running to him, the ambulance comes to you. That takes a lot of time, too. We're going to change history, and we're going to make a 90-second response time. People said, how are you going to do this? Well, if you get enough people, you get a 90-second response time. More people that know what's going on and have the knowledge of how to save people, you would actually lower response time. So when we started this, we started between the Jewish communities in Jerusalem and mostly Orthodox, and then it started going out to the non-Orthodox communities, and it was amazing because we also connected people from all different diversities who don't usually talk to each other. What happened was years after, we did amazingly, we were very successful. We started saving lives every single day of people who otherwise would not survive. One day, this guy, Muhammad Asli, comes over to me together with Murad Aliyan, and he says, my father collapsed at home in Abu Tor, East Jerusalem. It took 52 minutes for an ambulance to arrive. My father was a young man. 55 minutes it took the ambulance to arrive, and my father was 52, and my father died just waiting for an ambulance. Now, you have to understand, these little villages, it's very hard to find addresses, and security-wise, they have to wait for police escort. So it took a long time. He said, my father could have been saved if Hatzalah would have been existing in my community. So I was thinking about Arabs. I never had Arabs in Hatzalah, but I said, when I started this 90-second response time, I wanted to have volunteers save lives of people, not of Jews, any people. And I said to Muhammad, let's go ahead and do this. And we started 25 volunteers, join them into United Hatzalah. And that's when I realized this is how we're going to win the 90-second responses. Have every type of person living in Israel unite in this organization. And every time something happens, we will have an app. And this is where I came up with the idea about 11 years ago to connect everyone with an app that today you all know about Uber and Get and other applications there. Create something that if something happens anywhere, the first Five volunteers will hear about this based on their geography location closer to the patient. Then I said, let's get even things faster. We have these Jews, Muslims, Christians running around saving people's life. We can't get there fast enough with our own cars. Let's create this thing called AmbiCycle. So I took this motorcycle and I outfitted it as an, as an ambulance. This was the first time in the world anyone does something like this. People said to me, who's going to give you authorization? I know we have a lot of government people in this room. So people said to me, how are you going to get the ortho how does the government authorize this? I said, God forbid, let's not even tell them. <laughs> I said, if we tell the government, I'm going to be 90 years old when this, we get the permits. And I think every government official, including Danny Danone, will agree with me. So we actually get, went ahead and we made this look so official, no one even thought it's not official. Well, we started saving lives much quicker because of these things. They could zoom in between the traffic, go on the sidewalks. You see these volunteers everywhere in Israel. We have 3,500 volunteers now, 600 of these. Well, I want to tell you something. This was my dream, and I never knew we were going to get to help over 2.5 million people, all as volunteers. Never charged even one patient for help. 
And this is spreading all around the world. This is not even in Israel alone. This is, we have it in 20 different countries. This idea is spreading. We have it here in Jersey City. It's going to Newark. It's going to other places. It's going to Detroit. This idea is the best idea to save lives. So I just spent Shabbat, this last Shabbat, by Ambassador David Friedman and his wife, Tammy. And we were going ahead, and, and David was telling me, this is the best investment he ever did. So I told him, I just met Alan Dershowitz, who's on our board. And Alan was telling me, Alan has a few of these ambucycles that he donated. And I, I, Alan said, if you think about it, if you ever want to fight BDS or the people who hate Israel, talk about United Hatzalah. How we unite every type of person in Israel, no matter what religion he comes from, to help each other save lives. This could happen only in Israel, literally. You see Hasidic Jews running on Shabbat, saving Muslims, and Muslims in Ramadan saving Jews with these ambicycles and their own private things. So I was telling David, David, the new ambassador, he says, this is what I'm going to talk about. He says, on the Senate, this is what I was talking about when they were questioning me about Israel, about my relationship with Israel and United Hatzalah. We have 600 of them, and whoever's going to be in Israel on the 26th of May we're dedicating another 180 new ambulocycles to Israel. <laughs> this morning, this morning, we saved a five and a half year old boy choking in kindergarten from in, eating a candy because of a volunteer that jumped out of work and he, and he responded and he got there and he saved the life of a boy, a little boy, because of this ambulocycle. Each ambulocycle like this costs $36,000 fully loaded with everything you have, but it responds to about 800 emergencies a, day, a year. So this is the right investment to do. Tell everyone about this. We have a booth outside. Love to welcome you all and see you in Israel in our dedication. Have your own ambicycle dedicated there. Thank you very much. Well, I think, uh, Yaakov, this is yours. Ellie, thank you very much. That was fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going out to lunch. Please be back here 3 p.m. sharp. Thank you very much. The show will continue. We hope you've enjoyed JBS's exclusive television coverage of the Jerusalem Post Conference from the Marriott Marquis Hotel in New York City. And we hope you'll stay right here on JBS for more of the best Jewish programming from all over the world. JBS, expanding Jewish understanding, celebrating all things Jewish. <laughs>